God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Unapologetic. I'm Julianne Thompson, and today I get to sit down with author, church planter, and evangelist Shauna Pilgreen. Shauna is the author of Translating Jesus, her new book all about how to share the gospel in a way our culture can understand. Shauna is also a mom and co-leads Epic Church in San Francisco with her husband, Ben. I'm excited to talk with Shauna about how we as followers of Jesus can learn to better share our faith with everyone around us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shauna. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, I want to start by asking a question. We actually ask every single one of our guests. So Shauna, what should Christians stop apologizing for and why? That's a great question. Um, I actually want to maybe even turn it around a little bit and even just say, like, I think at times we probably need to apologize more. I think there's some things that um, we even just can even take a stand alongside the church and alongside other brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, hey, you know what? We probably haven't been the best listeners to our culture. There's been times I feel like we probably haven't represented Jesus well to other people. I know we get clumped into... Um, oh, you're this kind of person, you're a part of this kind of group. And I think sometimes we probably should apologize more um, to our culture and just kind of go ahead and extend that olive branch, that that peace offering. Um, but to answer your question fully, like you asked, I think there are times where we don't have to apologize for, oh. for what we believe and who we believe in and the stance that we want to take because Jesus is worthy of our love and our devotion, and that's something we don't have to apologize for. Well, thank you, Shauna. I really appreciate your honesty and your answer, and I want to jump right in to talk about you. You and your husband co-lead Epic Church in San Francisco, which is a multi-ethnic church in a huge secular city. So of all places, how did you end up planning a church in San Francisco? Yes. So I'm happy to say that we've called San Francisco home for 13 years now. This is wow. home. It's home. I know we, we both have our, our roots are in um, the Southeast part of the country. So yeah, that's where we grew up. That was our culture um, our childhood culture, our, um, where we did university and everything. But when we decided to plant in San Francisco, we really, we were living in the Midwest. We were a part of a great missions minded, um, church in the Midwest. And mm -hmm. it was there that we began to sense God calling us to church planting. And we just began to kind of open it up like, God, where are you calling us? And mm -hmm. we really wanted to go to a place where the church was not thriving, where there wasn't a strong group of churches banding together um, in the kingdom of God. And so we narrowed it down to five cities and we ended up just through time of prayer and discernment and getting wisdom from people we narrowed it down to San Francisco. Well, being in San Francisco, I am sure that you have touched many of lives in your time of ministry. How has that journey of starting this church changed your view of your family and maybe your view of God? Yeah, I would say maybe mostly my view of God. Growing up in a culture um, in the, again, in, in the South, I, mm -hmm. I grew up in what I would call just a single culture. Whereas here, being in a global city, we really get to rub shoulders and do life with people all over the world. And so I've had to learn to listen. I'm still learning to listen. And learning to listen allows me to understand people from different cultures, different contexts, different languages, different beliefs and value systems, while widening my my understanding and my my empathy and understanding of, of what other people, how they've grown up, how they've been raised, what they believe. I think sometimes we as Christians are afraid to be open to what other people believe, afraid that it's going to affect our own faith. But what I've learned in our 13 years of living in the city is being open to hear how other people process life and their different values actually helps sharpen my faith because then it allows me to come back to the scriptures. What is it? Why do I believe what I believe? And so I greatly appreciate just the freshness 
of being in a global city where we really get to learn Um, from all types of people. And not only do you serve at your church, but you're also a network director of Alpha USA. What is Alpha for maybe those of us who don't know? And how did you get started serving on their team? Yeah, so Alpha is, it's just a safe, judgment-free space um, held in churches and youth groups and, and prisons and dinner parties. And it's, you're posing a series of questions to the curious, the skeptic, maybe those that are deconstructing their faith, um, those who don't have a faith. And you're posing these questions as simple as who is Jesus? Why should I read the Bible? How do I resist evil? You're posing these questions that are um, based on scripture, but you're allowing a conversation to flow from that question where people can say whatever mm-hmm. they believe. They, wow. You're creating a safe space where they're not judged for having a different thought from you. And mm-hmm. what ends up happening is you journey with, with people mm-hmm. over the series of questions is they become more exposed to the love of Jesus through you. I, for, for, the, for the Christian that's leading a group, what I've learned fr- from all of this is that you learn how to be more hospitable. You learn how to listen well. And um, yeah, so that's what, that's what Alpha is. And like I said, it's run all across the world. And the way I got introduced to it is that we went and um, we went over to London. Holy Trinity Brompton is the church where it began. And so we went over for a conference and I got exposed to what it is. And we came back and started running it at our church. And honestly, as I continue to run Alpha in our church and we're beginning to run it in a prison here and schools here, um, dinner parties, it's just it allows you space and um, to sit across the table from someone who doesn't share the same belief with you. And it's just a beautiful way to um, express the love of Jesus in ways that are a little bit counterculture to how people are expecting it. I love that. And I can tell you're so passionate about it. And why do you believe Alpha is such a good vehicle for discipleship specifically? Yeah. So it really is just, it's you're introducing someone to Jesus. And I think right now we live in a time where people are skeptical about the church. They're skeptical skeptical about even pastors and and church leadership. And to think that instead of saying, hey, you know, handing them a track or handing them something where it's like, you need to believe what I believe right now. Instead, it's like, hey, can we just journey together? We're not in a rush. Let's take our time. I want to share what I believe. But before I share what I believe, I would love to hear what you believe. And I think as we just create space that's not rushed and in creating the space that's not rushed, it allows someone to feel like, hey, she really listens. He really cares. And you just begin to open up that space. And I think that's what's countercultural. What's countercultural is to take time to listen and to say, I've got time and space for you. And running Alpha on a regular basis builds that time into our schedules. Mm-hmm. And um, we're seeing it make a huge difference. Well, wow, that's, that's incredible. And at Unapologetic, we kind of have a similar mission. We are so passionate about making sure that God's word is relevant. And in our culture, people are, are aware. And, and so that's what the show is all about, which is very similar to your brand new book translating Jesus. So what inspired you to write a book about how we talk about the gospel? And why do you think a book like this is necessary for today's culture? Well, I love the question. I am very passionate about introducing people to Jesus. And honestly, in a global city, I have opportunities almost on the daily because I come in contact with people who just don't know him. They've never been introduced to him. But um, that being said, the gist of the book, I really write to two people. I write to the person who's been in church almost all their lives. They, they know how to do church really, really well, but almost to the point that they don't feel like they're culturally relevant anymore. They feel like they've lost touch with culture. They don't know how to relate. And so really, I really try to offer a fresh perspective of you've got what the world needs, and that's Jesus. And I want to help you connect with culture. And then I also write to the person who's maybe new to faith, and they they need they actually need to connect more with Christian community and figuring out what that looks like. And so translating Jesus is all about the idea of learning the language of culture, which is paying attention, and learning the language of Christ, which is prayer. And when we can speak both languages, we actually, as Christians, know how to talk to culture. And it allows those of us that feel really in touch with culture to know how to relate with Christ. 
And can you give us maybe some specific examples of some of the ways Christians talk or things we say that the culture isn't understanding? Yes. I mean, I think if you just, just even go back in your mind to maybe a time you were at church this uh-huh. past week and the songs that we sing, the language that we use, we can, we can, we can speak that at church, but it's not going to translate. For example, I mean, we sing songs about, um, you know, dry bones walking or, you know, he turns graves into gardens. There's a lot of biblical language that our culture Mm -hmm. doesn't understand or know how to relate to. So this Mm -hmm. is where listening really comes in. And as Mm -hmm. we listen to culture, and I really want to emphasize that as we're listening to culture, keep in mind, God is always ahead of culture. It's not like we're trying to catch up with culture because Christians are behind. God is always ahead. So we're listening to culture because we want to best know how to communicate with culture. And so I think therein lies the difference. And practice makes perfect. So why do you think that Christians need to practice translating Jesus in order to be effective in ministry? Well, one, I think we've got to present ourselves as unpolished. And I realize like there's some maybe backlash with that, but I think sometimes we have this mindset that we've got to be all put together. We've got to know what we believe. We've got to have all the answers before we can begin to talk about Jesus. And that's not the way it is. In fact, if you look through the scriptures, Paul and all the New Testament writers, they're, they're figuring out what Jesus has done in real time you know, what the resurrection means for them. And so I, my, my challenge for all of us is to go out there and just go ahead and start having those conversations. And again, I'm not saying, you know, just to tap a stranger on the back and begin, you know, to preach to them. I'm just saying, think about the people that you do like with and just start with like, you know, just the simple questions of what's something that you're burdened about or what's going on in your family. And just even starting that simple conversation, that simple dialogue, as the conversation begins to open up, you're figuring out a way to bring Jesus into that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I I think you're absolutely right. We are all people, we are all sinners, and that's why we need a savior. So if we are looking at this on a very practical level, where can we all start if we want to model this? Yeah, again, I think it really is just um, being a good listener, but it's it's starting the conversation. So for example, let's say that you're in line at your favorite coffee shop and you're, you're placing an order with a cashier, uh, but no one else is in line. So take that opportunity just to ask the barista, hey, how's your day going? You can do one of two things. I'm at a place now where I would just could simply say, hey, I'm a person of faith. I would love to pray for you today. Is there a way I can pray? And they might say no, and that's fine. If they say no, just know in your heart, you can still pray a blessing for them. Perhaps they'll say yes, and they might give you something that they want you to pray for. Then the next question would be, hey, because no one else is in line, can I take the time to pray with you right here? And they might be receptive of that. It could be that they tell you something to pray for and Praying right there on the spot is not something that they're interested in. But again, you can just say, hey, I'm praying about that for you today. So that's just one way of just bringing, uh, I talk a lot about just praying on the spot in the book. Um, and that's 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 one opportunity. Another thing is just even asking them, like, hey, how's your day going? What are you hopeful for? And allowing, again, now we're listening to what their answer is going to be. And by taking that posture of a listener, and oftentimes even people in culture don't even take that posture. You've now done something that's probably caught them off guard. And I think I think as we practice this, practice the art of listening, we're going to be pleasantly surprised at who ends up opening mm-hmm. up with just a simple question as mm-hmm. how are you? Um, how's your day going? What can I pray for you about? I think a lot of people think that sharing faith, they say, well, you know, someone un- unapologetic can do this, but I can't do this. I don't have the gift of evangelism. How would you maybe encourage our listeners that that might be out of their comfort zone, that it's a little too bold? Is there some advice or tips that we we could share with them? Well, if I can, I want to tell you a story about how you can maybe practically do this. Of course. Uh, I remember one day when... Um, a rideshare picked me up. He was taking me to church. And so I say in the book, we went through in conversation uh, and by car. So I began to tell him where we were headed and, and um, why I go to church on Sundays. And he felt comfortable kind of telling me what was going on in his life. And he began to share how he was working really hard and dealing with a lot of stress and trying to get his family out of his home country. 
um, here to the States. And in process, I could hear, and I just was sensing it from the spirit that he's dealing with a lot. And obviously that's what he was saying, you know, just with the, with the stress that was going on. And so before we, um, we were getting closer to the church and I just said, Hey, I was like, if you'll keep your eyes open, I would love just to pray, pray a prayer of peace over you. And, um, it was very clear. We both had faith, but we had faith in two very different gods, but I know that the name of God was something he was comfortable with. And so I just began to pray and I prayed that God would give him peace and that God would, would protect his family. And it was a short prayer, nothing special in the words that I used, but I was praying to God and I prayed in the name of Jesus. And as I, I got ready to get out of the car, he said, one, no one's ever prayed with him before. And he said, too, he's never felt peace like that. Now, you and I both know that there was nothing I did. It was everything that he was experiencing came from, from Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit. But that's just a small example of those moments happen every single, those opportunities, I'll say, come to us every single day. And I talk in the book that what we're doing is we're practicing the art of double listening. We're both listening to someone. And we're also listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And when we, that's that double listening and something beautiful happens. And this is where, for me, where practice becomes not perfect. It becomes maybe permanent. It's like the more I practice this, not even necessarily the better I get at it, but the more opportunities I want to, I want to engage with God even more. And it took you being bold. And that's incredible. You were able to bless someone by your boldness that day. And in your book, you also talk about how we have to effectively understand the language of the culture to communicate the language of Christ. So how do we do that without getting pulled down by the culture? Well, again, and I I said this earlier, God's ahead of us. So it's not like we're not going to mess up the good news. Like we're not going to, you know, It's been tested and tried and continues to be proven that it is the best news that this world is going to receive. So we're not going to mess it up. That's true. And most times we're going to have an opportunity to have another conversation with a friend or family member. So we need to treat it like this is just an ongoing conversation. We don't have to get everything out in this 15 minute or this one hour lunch. So I think for starters, we just need to take the pressure off of ourselves that it's all up to us. And really just lean in to the person of Jesus and to the work of the Holy Spirit and just just pick up where we left off and stay really engaged with what what is going on in this present moment. Well, you also talk about how we're called to lay down our lives for our friends, starting with awkwardness and discomfort. Can you talk a little bit about this? Well, you know, Jesus is the one who says, you know, we're going to, we're going to lay down our lives for for our friends and family. But I I do talk about the awkward Christian (laughs) and I laugh at (laughs) Tell us about it. (laughs) I think we would all say, yeah, I've probably had one of those awkward moments. Or maybe we would even say like our non-Christian friends have definitely said, yeah, she's been a little awkward about this. (laughs) Um, But I, I, I share in the book, just those little examples of, you know, whether it's you know, uh, watching a, a football player, you know, act really um, proud and silly or whatever in the end zone after they've made a touchdown or or just how elaborate people can get with marriage proposals or baby announcements or you name it. I think when we're passionate about something and we believe in it to our core, sometimes it can make for some awkward, awkward moments. But I, I, I kind of say it, uh, you know, lightheartedly in that, when we, um, we, when we truly believe that he has done so much for us, I can't help but um, just be true to my character and to my personality and figuring out a way to like, hey, how do I let you know this good news? And I'll just, I'll just tell you another like real life example. I'm doing life with a friend. And if you were to look at just who we are on paper, you would think, what do these two ladies even have in common with one another? We're so different, but I would say in our eight years of friendship, she who is not a believer in Jesus yet and myself, who is, I'm just continually trying to become more and more like Jesus. We would both say, we just have this unique friendship where we've, we've not let that be something that just keeps us apart. We're going to go on a walk in a few weeks and she's going through a really tough time right now. And what I know is that as she's going through a tough time, I'm praying for her. I'm encouraging her. 
I send text messages to her that are just prayers that she will often say, hey, I don't have a faith that you have, but can I pray this prayer? Absolutely, she can. And so I just share that real life example to say, I'm journeying with her. I'm still growing in my faith. She's still figuring out if she wants this faith. But I think ultimately, like, that's what it's like. And when we look at the life of Jesus and his followers in the New Testament, you just see them. They're on journeys with people day in and day out. And so much comes down to us being our authentic selves in front of people and us really taking the time to listen and to care. I don't know why it is so hard to share the gospel to our friends and family. I think that's often the hardest time to share the gospel. Why do you think it's so hard to have authentic conversations and you don't want to sound like you're preaching to them? I think our friends and family need to see that hey, we're still on a journey. We still mess up. You've already pointed out we are sinners um, saved by grace. And I think that almost portrays maybe the most beautiful picture to somebody. And I think it also, um, I think it shines a light for our non-Christian friends to say, to say that the Christian life is not the perfect life. The Christian life is identifying with someone who is perfect, who is daily helping me become more holy and more made into his image. And so really spending that time at the cross, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, I realize on a daily basis, I need his grace and forgiveness. And I think um, that's really a huge part of the good news, a huge part of the gospel that we probably need to be more, um, it's just, it needs to be more forefront in our conversations with other people. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to this because uh, you had just mentioned your book is divided into three places, Christ and culture meet, the gate, the cross and the table. Uh, can you really set the stage for our viewers and explain what those three uh, three things are? Yes. And I've been a Christ follower for since I was eight and um, <laughs> I'm not eight anymore. So I followed <laughs> Jesus for a long time. But I think what I've had in my mind is that it's a, it's a start to the end and it's this linear path. Like, okay, I've checked the boxes. I'm getting closer to eternity. All things are good. And what I'm discovering is that the, the path from the gate, the cross and the table, there's a lot of back and forth all over the place. It's not this, it's not this um, simple with a nice bow on top. But at the same time, I think it's more abundant this way. And so I talk about, Spending time at the gate, you're spending time with, um, you're, just, you're out in culture, you're at the doctor's office, you're at the grocery store, you're on the sports field, you're picking up your kids, um, you're traveling, like that's the gate. It's just where you're going to find culture on a daily basis. And so here, it's just carrying this beautiful truth that Jesus loves you. And that's the message that we want to portray just as we're at the gate. And then I talk about the cross being this place where, where I am meeting with God, I'm meeting with Christian community, I'm on my knees, needing repentance, I'm, I'm here receiving his grace, I'm growing deeper in my relationship with Jesus, deeper into to authentic Christian community. And then there's this place at the table. And what, what my hope is with the book is that we find ourselves at the table where I literally can be having a conversation um, with the barista who maybe doesn't share my same faith and I'm about to take my cup of coffee and I'm about to sit down and have an accountability conversation with a dear sister in Christ and that we can switch and have these conversations at the table between the non-Christian and the Christian. So those are the three places that we go. But again, it's not this linear path that we're on, but it's a lot of back and forth all over the place. So I can be on a walk one afternoon with my friend that I referenced earlier. I can be in a ride share with someone who maybe has a faith, but not in the same God that I have a faith in. And then I could be heading into to church where I'm going to be singing these songs that aren't um, translatable outside of the church. And so we're constantly in these conversations. But the one thing that is constant is that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he's the one that is, that is king of my heart. And he is the good news that I have for this world. And you've shared some incredible stories that have come out of translating Jesus. What specifically is some of the fruit that you've seen from these efforts? Oh, my goodness. Well, again, it's ongoing. And so mm -hmm. what these stories end up doing for me personally, and again, I live in a city of 800,000 people. And um, so it's, it's not like 
you know, I, I go places and I don't, I step into a place and I remember being in a small town where you couldn't go anywhere without running into someone, you know, that's not the yep. case here, <laughs> but I will tell you, I will tell you the beautiful thing that, um, maybe my favorite thing that comes from these stories is when I see connections happen. And what I mean by connections is when, when I see someone that I've journeyed with and I've invited to church for many years and they step into our church and I see them meet other people that are my dearest friends. So when I see those connections happen, I won't tell you the whole story, but I tell a story in the book about being at Marshall's store. Um, I end up buying a dress there, but I encounter a, a homeless man who was shoplifting. And in that encounter, what I ended up finding is that the store manager approached him and offered him um, a basket to put his goods in. So she wasn't accusing him of shoplifting. She was giving him a way out only to find that that store manager is a Christ follower. So I talk about there in the store that day, I'm encountering a homeless man who's right beside me attempting to shoplift only to discover that I'm telling him how much Jesus loves him. And then you've got the store manager really living out the, the ways of Christ in front of him. So I think some of my favorite moments, or I will say the favorite moment is when I see, when I see connections happen. That's incredible. And you know, it all goes back to the importance of working on those bilingual skills, you know, when it comes to the gospel and not simply staying in our comfort zone of talking to other believers or continuing to preach a gospel our culture doesn't understand. And, and so in your book, you go on to say, if we ever lose our fascination with Christ and his word, we lose our effectiveness for Christ and his world. How can we cultivate a fascination with Jesus in our own lives to be more effective evangelists? Just personally, what I've discovered is that it's really helpful that you have people like-minded who, again, my first book is called Love Where You Live, so I'm kind of using that phrase, but you really want to find people around you who truly love where you live. They love the people and the culture, and they care deeply for what God is doing right here in the place that you call home. Now, chances are high. These are going to be people that are in your small group that you do church with. So I think finding a group of people that you that you can share stories with that are going to encourage you on this, that will say, hey, what were some conversations that you engaged with this week? Where were the opportunities that you had an opportunity with words or without words um, to introduce people to Jesus? I think that's really crucial to just ongoing accountability I think it strengthens your faith. It strengthens their faith. I mean, so much of what happens is if someone comes to me and they're telling me like who they engaged in conversation with about Jesus, that grows my faith in the week. So I would, I would just start there. There's not many examples, but that's just one way, one way of doing that. Well, what a great way to wrap up the show. I just feel like we truly have seen your heart for evangelism and all of the incredible ministry that you do. How can we stay in touch with you and your work? Sure. I love to hang out at Instagram. So it's at Shauna Pilgreen. And then I tell stories and just share a lot of practical things that we've even talked about here today. And my website is shaunapilgreen.com. Shauna, thank you so much for taking the time to be on our amazing Unapologetic show. We're so appreciative of you. Thank you for having me. This was a fun conversation. Stay connected with Julia and Unapologetic on all social media channels. Go to ptv.org slash Julia.